Welcome to the Student Success Podcast. I'm Al Solano, founder of the Continuous Learning Institute, or CLI, a higher education online resource focused on providing community college and open access university educators with practical information on how to get results at their campus. As a resource within CLI, the Student Success Podcast is focused on just that, the challenges, opportunities, failures, and successes of practices intended to improve student success and equity. The goal is to leave you with thought-provoking ideas, not some bolts information, and or lessons learned from the field so you can consider how you might apply them to your institutional context. For today's podcast, it's a privilege to have historian, scholar, and teacher, Dr. Kevin Cruz. Kevin studies the political, social, and urban-suburban history of 20th century America, focused on conflicts over race, rights, and religion. He has particular interest in segregation and the civil rights movement, the rise of religious nationalism, and the making of modern conservatism. His first book, White Flight, Atlanta, and the Making of Modern Conservatism, won prizes including the Francis B. Simpkins Award for the Southern Historical Association, for the Best First Book in Southern History, and the Best Book Award in Urban Politics from the American Polit- Science Association. His second book, One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America, examined the rise of American religious nationalism in the mid-20th century and its legacies in American political and religious life. Kevin recently published Fault Lines, A History of, of America Since 1974, a trade textbook with co-author Julian Zelizer. A History of the Past Four Decades of American History, the book chronicles the origins of the divided states of America, a nation increasingly riven by stark political partisanship and deep social divisions along lines of race, class, gender, and sexuality. Now, many of you might be wondering, what's this Princeton guy doing on a podcast focused on community college and open access universities? Well, I'll tell you, uh, you'll see why in a moment. So, Kevin, welcome to the Student Success Podcast. So good to be here, Al. Thanks for having me. So a little bit of context. I grew up in New York City, and I decided right out of high school that I just wanted to do something different. I wanted to serve. So I gave my mom a heart attack, and I uh, decided to en- enlist in the Marine Corps. I did a couple of tours overseas, and when I was done with that, the last one was in Somalia, which had a significant impact on me. It was an operation to Basically, our mission was to help people from starvation, <laughs> and we actually did a pretty good job. We cleared the way for the food to get in. Didn't have a very good ending, unfortunately, but still, um, it had a significant impact on me. Uh, we actually helped to rebuild an orphanage and kind of got a taste for education, if you will, because it was also a school. And so when I left, I decided to go back to school, and I, I went to a community college, And I had faculty that put me under their wing and were really supportive and mentored me and helped me through it. And they said, hey, Al, you're originally from New York because I stayed in California. I was stationed in California. And said, hey, you should you should uh, apply to some colleges in New York. And they said, like, well, like Cornell. I said, what? Me? Get into that place? No way. That is just not me. That's just not for people like me growing up in very low income situation. But I did. I got in. I double majored in government and history. It was great. I had just a great time, learned a bunch. But fast forward two decades later, and I'm I'm wondering, what's going on with some of my old professors? As I was looking about about a year ago, one of them, my advisor, Richard Pollenberg, I I saw that is, um, oh, and one of his students is doing great work, and he's uh, written these books. And then I look at Kevin, and I look at the picture, I go, that was my TA. (laughs) (laughs) So I reached out to you, said, hi, how you doing? And gosh, you've done such such great work since earning your PhD from Cornell. So um, I just wanted to give everybody a, l- a little bit of, of background there. It's really, really good to see you. Although the podcast is all audio, we all, we're, we're seeing each yeah. other here. So it's well, good to see you. You have not changed. That, let's assure everyone listening that we're both incredibly handsome and still look like we did uh, back in the 90s, okay? How about that? No, it's better. We look better, man. Oh, better. Oh, yeah, okay, fine, fine. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> so I like to start the podcast by asking guests, if you know, if you wouldn't mind sharing a hobby or a talent, a special superpower that, that you wouldn't mind sharing. I don't have any exciting superpowers, but, but a hobby is I've always been really into music. Um, I was a, a DJ in college, and um, I have... I have way too many CDs. I don't think I have a CD player anymore, but I uh, kind of 
always have lost myself in music. And so that's, that's some place I go, uh, I don't know if it's a hobby or a, it's certainly not a skill, but it's, it's a place I get lost in music. So I'll say that. All genres or any particular ones you're interested yeah, in? All, yeah. Yeah. And th- so that was the thing, this, uh, this, uh, uh, I went to uh, university of North Carolina and the radio station there was a free form station, which meant not just different kinds of programs, but every DJ was encouraged to play everything from, you know, blues, jazz, and country up to uh, hip hop and, and kind of alternative rock and, and everything in between. So, and I soaked it all up. I love everything. And so I love, you know, corny old 1930s country and 50s blues and oldies and, and current stuff. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm an omnivore when it comes to music, right? Would you consider uh, doing some DJing again? Or are you just too busy? <laughs> I would love to, but I am way too busy. I mean, that t- it takes up a lot of time, not just the time you're on the air, but what I didn't realize when I started that job was, you know, you got to go there like an hour or two ahead of time to pick out all the stuff you're going to play, right? To think it through and to kind of pull stuff out of the library, which is fun, but I could do it when I was 18. I, I don't think I could do it at uh, 49. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think my days are long gone. <laughs> I think well, you should. I, I DJ for my kids in the car. They love it. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about your kids or just show up to class one day with the whole DJ gear and then that's what you do for the class. I mean, I, I do still, I play song, I play a song before and after lecture. So I've, I've kind of, I've worked it in. So, you know, uh, I just did the civil rights movement uh, yesterday and I played a, a song from the Freedom Singers at the start. And then I closed out with Sam Cooke's Change is going to come. And my TAs always say, you intro these like a DJ. I'm like, yeah, I know. This is, this is my one outlet. Let me have it. There you go. There you go. I want to set the stage for the for my first question. Yeah, so bear with me here. I was quite blown away by the historical knowledge I, I gained at both the community college and, and at Cornell. In particular, what I learned from Walter Lefebvre's uh, American Foreign Policy Seminars and Richard Pollenberg's two-course Modern American History Sequence. You know, I learned that America wasn't that exceptional after all. But to me, as a former Marine and continuous improvement guy, I, I saw that as an opportunity to understand really the ugly yeah. um, so we can work toward progress. And it's part of the reason I dedicated myself to uh, Korean education. But as you know, Kevin, some people unfortunately take offense at the notion that teaching that America was never that great to begin with, right? But it's true. And it bears out in, in so much data, critical measures from racial justice data to the ridiculous wealth gap that we have. However, I was kind of struck by something this past year, Kevin. Um, I didn't learn until recently about Black Wall Street. Um, Mm -hmm. And for the audience, for those of you who are not familiar with Black Wall Street, in 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma's Greenwood District, known as Black Wall Street, was one of the most prosperous African-American communities in the country. But on May 31st of that year, a white mob descended into the town for two days and just unprecedented racial violence. Um, 35 city blocks went up in flames, 300 people died, and 800 were injured. There are other examples like this. I'm not I'm not necessarily upset at the professors for not covering this event and similar ones like it, but I feel that given recent history, specifically since 2016, Kevin, that higher ed should revisit some of its curriculum. Mm-hmm. And so for me, because all of the institutions I work with serve disproportionately impacted student populations, uh, for example, former foster youth, formerly incarcerated LGBTQ students, veterans with visible and invisible disabilities, poor whites and students of color who have experienced racism throughout their lives, it's important for them to have a deep understanding what led them to be disproportionately impacted to begin with. So research in, in higher ed and also in K-12 now demonstrates that when students develop what's now known as critical consciousness, this uh, this awareness of uh, oppressive elements in society, they're actually more than likely to succeed in college. We actually have a tremendous dropout rate at community college and open access universities. Life just happens uh, to so many of these students. But the research shows that when they feel a deeper sense of purpose, a glue, if you will, that allows them to stick to their college education until the finish line so they can actually go back to their communities and, and make them better. So with that as the backdrop, Kevin, given your deep historical scholarship, teaching experience and passion, what's been key missing information from most political, social and economic studies 
how can we infuse this knowledge in, in the student experience, especially given what's unfolded in, in the last five years? Yeah, it's a big question, but it's a good one. And, and I'd say, look, your, your starting point about that we've got to teach the ugly parts of the American past as well is, is obvious. I mean, we have to do that, right? If, if you want a history that is purely celebratory, that just tells you the great things the country has done, that tells you the country has done no wrong, that's not history. That's propaganda, right? And it's not just that that's not history. It's, it's not useful. Uh, the real draw of history, I think, what I've always found, uh, it, it come from where I come from uh, and, and, and my own experiences, and I don't have any of those those, you know, kind of hardships or hurdles you just rattled off, which are considerable. But even from my own perspective as a, as a you know, middle class white guy from the South, I always turn to history to try to figure out where my world came from, right? And, and, and try to understand what I had done. So that first book, White Flight, I did was basically me saying, well, the civil rights movement sounds really fascinating, but I don't recognize the white people in this, right? They're either bloodthirsty racist or they're a handful of crusading, crusading do, do-gooders. Most white people weren't, weren't really like that, one or the other, right? They're somewhere in the middle between that black and white and that gray. I wanted to learn about them. I basically wanted to learn about people like me. Uh, and so that was what led me to my first book. And that's the real utility in history is, you know, history doesn't necessarily repeat perfectly, but it rhymes a lot uh, and it explains a lot of, of where we got to. And so I think these people who hold up history as having to be perfect in the past where everyone was a hero and everyone did good and there was no wrong, or if there was a wrong, it was obvious and it was quickly overcome, right? That's not useful, right? If your version of Martin Luther King is Martin Luther King stood up on the March on Washington and uttered one line only about the content of his, uh, of his character, of his, of his kids, and that racism was bad, and everyone went, oh, racism is bad. Well, that solves it, and moved along. That has no connection to the present, right? That doesn't explain anything about where we are or what we're dealing with now. If, however, you go back and you look at what Martin Luther King said at the time, what he said in the speech, and sorry, I lectured on this yesterday, so it's fresh on my mind, but what he said in that speech, he talks about police brutality. He talks about economic inequality. He talks about uh, a limited citizenship, right? He talks about the kind of things that we're talking about today. Look at the letter from a Birmingham jail. If you read that today, if you ripped the title off that, if you changed the word Negro to African-American, you could convince people it was like a, 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 a critical race theory approach. It's all about structural racism and inequality. It's about how the law might seem equal on the surface, but it's discriminatory underneath. It's all of that, right? The past speaks to us today. Something uh, Dick Pollenberg uh, said, which which still sticks with me, is someone asked him why he studies history. Uh, and, and Dick passed uh, just a, a year ago. Someone asked him before he died what why he studied history. And he said, look, the big issues we're wrestling with today, what does freedom mean? What does justice mean? What does equality mean? We haven't maybe had the same specifics for that conversation in the past, but we've talked about those big issues again. And so if you look at how people in the past have reckoned with those issues of inequality, of injustice, of a lack of freedom, and how they got better or how they maybe got worse, we can learn some lessons from that, right? So there's a utility in history. So absolutely, if students see a connection in the past, see a utility in that, if it speaks to them, if it's not some distant foreign world, but it's got some connection and some resonance in their lives, if they can borrow something from that, that's fantastic. That's what we should be doing. The, the goal here is if we're trying to make this relevant and meaningful to our students is it's all there. We just have to point them to the right parts of it because the, the past speaks to us today. And given all your scholarship, what would you say are some of those key points for students? A, a couple of things I like to do when I, because I can't lecture on everything, right? So I've got to pick and choose. So I don't have pure chronological coverage when I do 20s. I kind of teach the mid 20th century, uh, kind of the 20s to the 70s. And I can't do everything in there. And so I try to, A, focus on what are the biggest moments. So we do kind of deep dives on the Depression and New Deal, and then in the 1960s and the Civil Rights Movement of the Great Society, uh, and then uh, kind of the, the white backlash era in Nixon. Each of those speaks to the present in deeply important ways. The, the New Deal, I think, shows us what government can do. We live in an era of kind of pinched expectations and um, and kind of a retreat from the public sphere. It shows what an aggressive public policy can do. It also shows the way in which economic inequality in the past have been reckoned with and alleviated through public and private programs. So I think that's remarkable. The, the Great Society era and the, the Civil Rights era shows the way in which deeply entrenched structural inequalities uh, that promote racism and discrimination 
uh, were rooted out and dealt with, not perfectly, but certainly a significant change at that period, right? And again, affecting real power in the lives of ordinary Americans and, uh, and generating results. The kind of George Wallace, Richard Nixon story, which I've always leaned into, just given my interest in, in modern conservatism, but certainly in the last five years, um, those lectures have really taken on a new meaning as I think people who, you know, students who came of age maybe in the, in the Obama era and hadn't seen this kind of prominent, uh, you know, white backlash uh, really step up uh, can take some heart on that. You know, I, I've, I've long lectured on, I've got a, and it's a lecture I love. It's based on Dan Carter's uh, book on George Wallace in part, and uh, which is a brilliant read if anyone's looking for a book recommendation. It's called The, um, the Politics of Rage. Uh, and, and, it's, and I use uh, video clips from a great PBS documentary and the American Experience documentary on George Wallace. Uh, which is is great. And I've long showed this. There's a great short clip of George Wallace at his rallies. It used to be something students laughed along with because he's kind of darkly funny and he's kind of got a sinister edge, but he's got a light comic touch. In the era of Trump, suddenly they stopped laughing because it looked exactly like a Trump rally. Like it was remarkable, both the way in which he kind of vilified people abroad, singled out people in the audience for retribution, pulled his followers in, mobilized them against this kind of menacing other out there, promised he alone could fix it, on and on. You know, so, so those residences are, are there too. So uh, there's a lot we can do. And it doesn't mean we're certainly not distorting the historical lens when we do this. We're just sh shining a light on the part of the past that, that has echoes of our present and, and amplifying it for the students and letting them see uh, those connections. History has a, a rhythm to it. Going back to helping students, especially those disproportionately impacted students, understand the, the legacies, why, why some of them have experienced disproportionately, especially students of color, studying Wallace, just for them to understand, we've been here yeah. before. This is, uh, is here to stay mm -hmm. for a long time. What are we going to do about it? Just learning about it, knowing that it's part of the culture. So what are some lessons learned from, for how people fought back in those days and how we're fighting now? You know, Virginia was just went to a mm -hmm. someone that Trump supported. And it just seems like the culture war, uh, the manufactured culture yeah. war continues to edge out policies that help yeah. the, those that, you know, who would benefit the most from those policies. Yeah. Um, so what, what are some lessons learned from the fights, the, pe the way people fought back then against Wallace and all that ideology and, and now? Well, I think the real lesson is, is a it's it's there, it's real. Uh, it's been kind of a perennial. Um, you know, the, the culture wars took place in the '90s when we were at Cornell. They took place in the '70s and the '50s and the '30s, and on and on and on. We could roll all the way back, probably to Salem, if we wanted to, right? Uh, so, so they've always been there. And and the key is that uh, a lot of times they succeed when they become the biggest issue in the room, and they become the biggest issue in the room often by default. And it's it's the it's we're recording this the day after um, of the Virginia uh, results. They're not even final yet. Uh, so this is a bit of a Monday morning quarterbacking. I may regret this later on. You know, I mean, what what we see here is uh, a you know these these states. I think we often overreact to these year after flips. Virginia and, and New Jersey often flip, and you know, I think Reagan won Virginia by a huge margin, and then it flipped the other way, like by 30 points in 81. You know, so, so this happens. Um, that said, there are uh, lessons to learn here about the, the success of, of this kind of uh, ginned up uh, anti-critical race theory backlash there. And it's that the culture wars work when they're the point of conversation, and they become the point of conversation largely through default. If Democrats don't have real changes that impact ordinary Americans' lives, then it becomes a conversation about CRT, right? If Democrats can point to free community college, or uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, like the, they like tax credits and things like that, fine. If they point to things like that, if they point to expansions of Medicare, they point to you know universal pre-K, things like that. They can have something that they can point to and say, "Look, these people over here are talking about things that aren't even being taught to your kids in school. I'm talking about something that's going to." Make daycare affordable, or make you know, uh, or or give you a leg up for college, or 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 you know, absolve your student loans. Right? Those are wildly popular things that they can do. If they don't do that, though, then all you have are the fears on the right, uh, and that then becomes the point of conversation. So I think the lesson here isn't that it's going to go away; it's going to be there. You've got to have a counter to it, and the counter should, can be both. What people like me have said is, A, you're wildly blowing that out of proportion. That's not really what we're talking about. But it can't just be that. They've got to be able to point to something really positive and really strong 
uh, on the left. Uh, that's how from the New Deal up to Wallace, the Democrats kept the white working class it was a core constituency, uh, along with a, a wide array of, of racial minorities. It was a core constituency of that New Deal coalition, because for all these groups, they could point to, you know, real substantial uh, economic gains, social security, minimum wage, you know, job protections, union laws, things like that, and say, and say, look, we've done that. We've helped your life in real ways. If you don't do that, then they're going to point to the imaginary threats. So those students that have a, a deeper sense of of history of this rhythm, part of what we're learning here is that if, if they happen to go into politics, that that messaging, uh, it seems like at least the Democrats, they they tend to lose on the message. I mean, here we are, right? We were, we've had this pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing the amount of vaccines that have been distributed. Yeah. That there are some economic indicators that things are m much better. There's mm -hmm. things that need to be improved, but none of that is part of the conversation. There, yeah. there seem to always to be on, on the defense. Oh, CRT. Oh, well, but it's important to to learn it, but then they don't point out. Well, we don't actually teach that right. at K twelve, right? So it's a it's the messaging, huh, Kevin? Uh, in part, yeah, yeah. I, I think Democrats still have this naive assumption that we've made things better and people will notice. People don't notice. Hmm. A lot of people aren't plugged into. Po I think people in Democratic politics, and I'm not one of them, but the, the the people who run it, I think might have an overblown sense of how plugged in people are to what's going on really in D.C. And this is something Republicans, I think, have learned really well, not just in terms of amplifying a sort of unifying message through the kind of the, the Fox News universe, but just making sure their names are on popular things. George W. Bush and Donald Trump literally put their names on checks that were sent out to people. <laughs> uh, when Obama you know, did the Stimulus Act, they had some you know, payroll tax deduction that was going to be easier and cheaper in the long run, but people didn't see his name attached to it. Right. They weren't thinking Obama gave me that money. They had a check from George W. Bush with three hundred dollars with his name. On it. And they had a check from Donald Trump literally with his name on it. Right. And could say, oh, OK, that that was good. I see the concrete result here. And Democrats have got to be better about that. Now, they've got some stuff they can point to, but I don't think they've done enough to it. I don't think Biden has. I think Biden has overcorrected from that era in which Trump was completely in everyone's faces nonstop. And we all said, God, we'd love to have a president we didn't think about every day. Yeah, Biden should step it up maybe a little bit and let us think about him a, a, a little bit more than he does. But I think in general, they've just got to do a better job of not just passing popular things. And there's so much they could do. That, and, and I realize the limitations on them in a 50-50 Senate and on and on and on. But there's so much they can do that's popular uh, that, that, that they, they say they want to do. Uh, that if they can just get a couple of these things over the goal line, and they seem to be close here now. They get a couple of things over the goal line and then just promote the hell out of it, right? And so if the conversation then is a year out, hey, we're still beating the CRT drum or whatever it is, the new caravan, whatever the new boogeyman on the right is, to say, okay, that's fine. They're telling you about all these things they're afraid of. Let's rattle off our accomplishments. And if they can do that, they'll maybe have a chance. The, the, again, the deck's going to be stacked against them in the midterms for a variety of reasons, historical trends, gerrymandering, on and on. But they'll have a better chance to cut their losses uh, and limit their losses there. Uh, if they've got a real agenda of success that they can point to. That's what works in the past. Again, you know, the New Deal, the Great Society, they racked up wins, right? Uh, they, they they struck when they had uh, uh, the edge in Congress uh, and made things happen. Uh, and they've got to do that again. Uh, the, these trifectas are rare uh, and they're going to be fleeting uh, if they don't if they don't get something done. Question I, I asked about updating the content of the, of the curriculum. Seems to me for students, it's important for them to understand these these historical situations, but then the lessons learned mm -hmm. about just even the messaging, right? Like what, what you just explained, if we could be more intentional for those who are going to go back to their communities, who are going to go work in, in government and get in politics to really understand that. And, and so they're learning this in higher ed. Mm -hmm. Is that why you feel that there's a segment of the society that really is against higher ed. We see this all the time. And this has been going on for a long time, yeah. right? Can you unpack that a little bit, kind of, kind of the origin of that and, and why that continues to to persist? Talking at the top of my head here, I, I think a lot of it is that higher education leads us out of our, it complicates our, our, our assumptions and it pulls us out of our pre-existing state of mind. 
ideally broadens our horizons, makes us think about things in new light. We question our previous assumptions. And if your politics are based on an idea that that's bad, that you should stick with the the exact values your parents imparted upon you, you should uphold their traditions, um, you should not question things, you should simply kind of push forward with what they've imparted to you, then yeah, I guess I could see higher education would be a threat to that. Uh, and maybe that's the, the, the fear of um, it's not just learning new things, it's learning different things. And that might make you a different person. Personally, I think that's a good thing. I think we all grow uh, the more we the more we learn. Uh, I think that it makes us into a, a stronger, more fully realized human beings. And it may not change your position. It might, in fact, it might make you you know, better able to defend it, right? Um, you know, these, these people who kind of live in an ideological bubble and never want to challenge, they fold pretty quickly when you bring the facts to them, right? Uh, but I think, you know, if you're, uh, so say if you're a, a, you know, hardcore conservative, I've seen ones go through Cornell and Princeton who came out even stronger because they kind of sharpened their their sword, you know, in ideological discussions in, in, in the classroom and things like that. And they got better at making their case. That can happen too. Uh, so it, you might have a change of heart. You might double down on what you've got. But there's a there's a way in which that knowledge, one way or another, is going to make you stronger and, and make you uh, a, a little more sure and a little more uh, uh, capable of not just believing certain things, but expressing them and holding them. So, Kevin, you're currently conducting research for a new book focused on civil rights. Of particular interest to me is how people on the right side of history confronted segregationists in higher ed. So, for example, at Ole Miss and University of Alabama. Could you share more about your, your research and, again, how it applies to what's what's going on today in society? Yeah, so uh, the book is on uh, John Doerr, who was um, the basically the, the head of the Civil Rights Division in the in the Kennedy and Johnson administration for much of that, and so he was the, the kind of the point man for civil rights from the federal government. And his pa- he was a Princeton alum, came from a small town in Wisconsin, that came to Princeton, and he donated his papers here uh, after he died, uh, and they're just incredibly rich. Uh, and so, yeah, those those fights over over higher ed are huge flashpoints in this, uh, and again show us the way in which um, uh, for a long time institutions of learning were you know effectively bastions of, of white supremacy you know they they and not just in the south I you know when I lecture on affirmative action up here I like to ask my students in what year did Princeton University first implement preferences uh, by race and gender and the answer is 1746 because for the first two dec- two centuries of our existence you had to be a white guy to come here uh, uh, they don't often think of it that way, but but that's that's true. So these institutions, public and private, north and south, east and west, um, were largely um, uh, uh, you know held off uh, and reserved um, for for white people. And, and I think for a variety of reasons, uh, and, and the most obvious one is that again that point earlier about if people get educated, they challenge not only their own assumptions about themselves, but the assumptions you've placed on them. The limitations you placed on them. There's a line I use when I when I uh, I'm a butcher it here, but there's a, a quote I like to do when I talk about the role of education in segregationist resistance because schools, of course, were the big thing; they were the big prize. Uh, and that, in you know, post emancipation, the the thing that scared Southern whites the most were the new levels of of education and literacy they saw in free blacks. And uh, and a, a professor actually from Ole Miss I put it best when he said that the reason whites are scared about this is that educated people make their own paths. They find their own places. And they didn't want freed blacks to do that. They didn't want them to have that mobility, that leg up, to have that, not only that vision of now where they wanted to take their lives, but the ability to do so. And that's what education is. Education opens doors. And and, and again, I'm talking at all levels here. And you, you open this up by saying, people might be surprised why this Princeton guy is on this podcast. I hope they're not. Uh, it, it, there was not a dividing line here, Al, and, and you know this better than anyone. Okay, the path you took to come to Cornell, starting a community college, where people get great, st- great foundations, great educations, uh, and find on their own sometimes a, a path uh, uh, to a place like Cornell or a place like Princeton uh, is remarkable. Uh, I'm on the graduate admissions committee uh, of my university this year, and every year we've 
find somebody who's past started at a community college and is going to come on and get a PhD at Princeton. And, and to us, that's a more impressive journey than some legacy kid who got into Harvard and, you know, had life handed to him, right? That shows somebody who has taken advantage of everything they've had in front of them and, and made the most of it and really shown uh, determination and, and moved up. And that's what education does. It's what it did historically in the 60s in the civil rights era. It, what it, it's what it does now, right? Uh, and, and I think one of the real positive changes I've seen at this place is the way in which it's opened up just in the time I've been here from being a kind of a very elite and elitist institution to one that has, you know, shifted away and, and all incoming students get needs blind admission. You get grants instead of loans. Uh, they've kind of, they've opened it up. So there's many more first gen students uh, here. That's great. That's what we as faculty want to see uh, because it, again, it is, it's, it's, the core of our student body who is coming in hungry to learn, right? They're not doing this because it's expected of them and they're checking a box. They really want to be here, right? They really want this passion. And that's what makes those students stand out. It's what made you stand out, Al, when all those years ago at Cornell, I re you, you said uh, originally, I bet you don't remember it. No, I remembered you because Dick Polenberg pointed me out to you and said, this guy has come up this way, Marine Corps Community College. He's here now. And I was like, that's a guy I want to work with. That's somebody who has got to drive here. So uh, that's still alive and well. Uh, and it's something that we see in the past, but it's something, uh, thankfully, we still see in the present, the way in which education uh, can be a ladder, right? Uh, uh, and, and I don't mean, like you know, economic mobility. It's partly that. But I mean personal growth and getting people to be the best people they can be. That's that's what we're trying to do here. Well, thank you for the kind words, man. I, I, I appreciate that. One of the things I got to tell you that's been really beneficial having a degree from an Ivy League is is the the, the branding helps. <laughs> yep. It's super helpful. I wish if I can turn back time, I, I wish I would have networked more. I was just busy just trying to yeah, you know, do my work, but I, I would have networked more. And I think that for disproportionately impacted students, the Ivy League or uh, other institutions like Stanford, they really could use those institutions, not necessarily because they teach better, <laughs> because I, I, I yeah. still remember my community college instructors, and by and large, they were better teachers than many of the university faculty. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yep, there's this this capital, this currency, this branding currency, currency, this this networking currency that these institutions have. But for decades, man, you know this, they have used standardized test scores, which mm -hmm. now we know from research, they pretty much just measure family wealth and resources. Yep. Um, yep. And it took a pandemic to finally say, hey, OK, we're not going to need them. We're not going to. They're optional. Mm -hmm. Is there going to come a time, Kevin, where, where these institutions finally let go of those just antiquated practices that, that really contribute to inequities. And because here's the thing, these institutions have billions of dollars in endowment yep. and they receive f millions of dollars in federal funding. And, and they just, they're so proud of their rejective status. You know, we, we reject 90 to 95% yeah. of students. I mean, yep. that's something to be ashamed of. So yep. uh, do you see that changing anytime soon? Well, I mean, I mean, the numbers, are, they're going to still reject that percentage. Um, but I, I think what we're, I'm hoping to see is that who's in that percentage that gets in becomes much more diverse. And, and again, in, just in my experiences in 20 years here at Princeton, it has for us at least, and I think in good ways, both by slight, we slightly expanded that group. We, they added a, we have residential colleges here. You step five and added a six. So basically increase the student body by 20%. And then that 20%, it was largely geared towards getting underrepresented groups. Now, the problem is that a lot of that percentage at these institutions are two groups. Again, when I lecture on affirmative action, I ask them what are the two biggest categories for special admissions at a university like Princeton? It's not racial minorities. It's not women. It's legacies and student athletes. And the legacy stuff is what's really baked in. And uh, I don't know how. I mean, there's obviously, an, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a, a kind of a self-perpetuating motion in that 
part, which is going to keep the legacy interest going. So you can whittle away at that. Um, I don't know how much you can do before the alumni rise up in arms, uh, you know, defending their own poor children. But I think by expanding that group like we did, that's the easy way. So it, was, so it wasn't a zero-sum game, you know. Again, to go back to George Wallace, that's how we always presented things. That any gain for someone else is a loss for you. And if African-Americans get something, it's coming out of the hands of whites. That's how Wallace always presented things. Instead, kind of grow the pie, right? You know, and so if you can expand that percentage a little bit, you can get more people in there and it improves it not just for those people, but for everyone. I think my student, the students who come from a, a better off background here have a better experience because they're not living in a bubble with people just like them from their background. Now, I, I think the, the campus is a richer place. It's a more lively place. There's more to do. There's there's more to learn from um, uh, discussions and classes are, are better as a result of this. Uh, diversity in every sense of the term. Um, so, so I think that's a real benefit here. Uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and standardized testing is, I think, a part of that, that that kind of pushes up that that group on the left. I do think you're seeing a, a slow revolt against that. It'll take time, uh, but I do think you're, you, you, we've we've seen it accelerated with the with the pandemic uh, period, as you noted, where people started to realize this. You know, we didn't need it that year. Do we need it any year? Um, I'm not, thankfully, not involved in admissions decisions at the undergrad level. Uh, but uh, I see the signs are there that they might be starting to, to, to weaken from that. And, and I hope it changes. As we wrap up, Kevin, imagine yourself, you're doing a lecture for a group of community college faculty administrators. A lot of, not just them, a lot of higher ed, the morale's kind of low. Yeah. You know, we've been through a lot these last five years and it's not going away. Nope. Uh, we're seeing higher ed being attacked constantly. But from a historical perspective, you've seen these rhythms. Yeah. Uh, what's some optimism that, that you can give to these educators as we're in the, the midst of a lot of challenges, a lot of struggles? In higher ed, it does come in waves. And there's, there's the, politically, there are periods of backlash, which are followed by periods of advancement. Uh, we've seen this time and time again. In terms of student demand, student interest, student ability to attend, some of that is driven by their own goals and needs, but a lot of it comes from external forces. The, the big boom in colleges in America uh, in, the, in the post-war period, post-World War II, happened because of the GI Bill. We shoveled a lot of money towards veterans like yourself and said, would you like to go to college? Uh, and that benefited not just them. Uh, it added a, a lot of people uh, to the roles. It had a lot of people to to the university community, which then had a ripple effect on those areas and, and made them much more profitable and, and much bigger. Or go back even further, uh, a lot of the the you know the, the so called land grant universities came about in the 1860s. If you're a fan of football in the Big Ten or Big Twelve, uh, you owe a lot to uh, what the Lincoln era Republicans did in, in putting those those universities on the map. Those kind of things can happen, and there's again discussions now about you know expanding access to community college, waiving of student loans things like that, which could make this much more amenable. And so there's a, there's a political aspect of this too. Uh, and that's going to require, you know, pressure at our end to keep this up. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's within, it's within the realm of possibility. Uh, and, and just when things look dark, I think the, the biggest lesson of history is that they don't stay dark. Uh, we have fumbled our way to the light time and time again. And, and part of the and this is, again, to circle back to our conversation about why do you study the bad parts of the past? To remember that they were once bad, and then they got better. And, and here's how they got better, right? And so I, I find that I think the most depressing way to teach history would be that everything used to be perfect, and now, God, it's all screwed up. Well, we don't know why. You know, that's awful. Instead, show people how we muddled through the dark times in the past. That's why I teach the, the the depression. That's why I teach the the civil rights struggle against institutionalized Jim Crow. Right? Is that those things were overcome, as they said in the civil rights movement, and, and they can be overcome again. Uh, and so um, I weirdly find some corners of optimism because I know just how bad things have been in the past. Right? It doesn't make me feel like we're living in some unique end times. But rather to go back and, and, and sink myself into the depths of McCarthyism or the despair of, you know, of, of the economy in 1931 or how deep racism looked like it was never going to be eradicated in the era of massive resistance in the 50s. And to know I can flip to the end of that book and see it came out all right. OK, well, I'm in the opening chapters of another book. And, and I think what we can do is take some heart 
and knowing that things can change. So things are not great for education right now, but they've not been great in the past. Uh, they can be they can be better again. That's beautiful. Thank you, Kevin. I needed that. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> if, I, if I improve the life of one person, Al, I'm glad it's you. Any last thoughts on, on our conversation that you would like to impart to the audience? No, I mean, this is, this has been a great chat and, and, and I've, I've enjoyed it a lot too. Um, uh, I, I think just history speaks to us and it should, um, uh, and it takes a little work to, to, to dig it out and, 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 and make sure we, we really see it. Uh, but, but I hope students can, can find the passion for it that, that we both had, uh, and, and see the, the meaning for it in their own lives today. So if you were to edit this, this podcast and add an intro song and an outro, what, what would it be? Oh, ah, my own intro and outro song. Um, anything I say, well, I will immediately regret in, in five minutes because I'll think of something better. You can't go wrong with James Brown. Uh, we could, we could start off with, uh, with an, an end with probably the same song, you know, give me an eight minute drum solo. That'd be fine. Uh, I'll have somebody come here and put a, put a cape on my back at the end and, uh, and, and walk off in a cold sweat. How about that? We'll end in that image, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Yeah. Thank you for participating in the Student Success Podcast, man. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Al. Take care now. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Podcast. Each episode has show notes, which include helpful links and necessary follow-up information to help you get results. Please consider subscribing to the Continuous Learning Institute website. There are no advertisements. It simply updates about articles, tools, resources, podcasts, etc., all tailored for you, the practitioner. Thank you.